Well, on behalf of the entire Westminster College family, I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you. Welcome to this historic place and to the second annual C.S. Lewis lecture. This lecture series is part of the Herod C.S. Lewis Professorship of Religious Studies, sponsored through a very generous gift of Jim and Sharon Herod, who are with us this morning, seated in the front row. A member of the class of 1957, Jim had a distinguished career with Edward Jones and has served on our Board of Trustees for 18 years. For the past few years, Jim has also served as chair of our Leading the Way campaign. Sharon has made Westminster her adopted school and is just as passionate about the college as Jim. Thank you, Jim and Sharon, for your generosity and for being with us today. A special greeting to those who have come from around the state and the region to hear today's lecture. We're gathered today in the Church of St. Mary, the Virgin Aldermanbury, built in 1677 by Christopher Wren, partially destroyed during the Blitz in 1940 and reconstructed stone by stone on Westminster's campus in the 1960s to commemorate Winston Churchill's famous Iron Curtain speech delivered here in March of 1946. I hope our visitors will have an opportunity to visit the National Church Museum just below the church during your visit to campus today. Today's lecture will be delivered by the Most Reverend Dr. Catherine Jeffords Shorey, presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. It is a distinct honor for me to welcome Bishop Catherine to Westminster College. As a lifelong Episcopalian, I have enormous respect and admiration for her faithful leadership of our flock. Thank you, Bishop Catherine, for journeying to the heartland to be with us today. I would now like to uh, call on the Reverend Dr. Marshall Crossnow to deliver our invocation. Marshall. Please pray with me. Almighty and eternal God, source of all that is beautiful, we give you thanks for the wonder of your creation in earth and sky and sea, for the beauty of holiness in the lives of men and women, for the wondrous gifts of daily food and drink, homes and families and friends. For minds to think, hearts to love, hands to serve, for all these beautiful gifts we give you thanks. Loving and gracious Father, source of all that is good, grant again that we might live in peace and concord with our neighbors. Bless us as we work for a world where none are ground down in opposition or oppression, but are lifted up in freedom where none are bound in misery, but all are liberated in your joy. Strengthen us to walk in righteousness, in goodness, in love. Fountain of all wisdom, source of all truth, instruct us this morning. Teach us in the ways that we should go. Incline our ears to hear your voice and open our eyes that we might behold your hand in all of your works. Keep us mindful of your wisdom, your light, and your truth. Thank you, Father, for all who've made this hour possible, for C.S. Lewis and his legacy, for Jim and Sharon Herod, for Herod C.S. Lewis Professor Clifford Kane, for the Westminster College community, for Presiding Bishop Catherine Jeffords Shorey, and for all of us gathered here this morning. We look to you now, gratefully and expectantly. Amen. The world in which we live as global citizens has too much and not enough. Too much violence, 
not enough respect, too much hunger and not enough to eat, too much apathy and not enough caring, too much hoarding and not enough sharing, too much callousness and not enough compassion, too much exclusion and not enough inclusion, too much war and not enough peace, too much poverty and not enough justice, too much plundering of nature and not enough caring for creation. And so the world needs people, people of faith and disbelief, of religion and unreligion, of this religion and that religion, in short, people of goodwill to join together in solidarity, to speak up, to speak out, and to act out the central values of their traditions in order to make the world a better place. Presiding Bishop Catherine Jeffords Shorey has done this, and she's encouraged her Episcopal tradition to do this as well. She's been the voice of understanding, of compassion, of inclusion, of justice, sometimes gently and pastorally, sometimes forthrightly and prophetically, and at times even controversially. When she has been controversial, speaking for people left out, people ignored, people disenfranchised, people marginalized, people abused, people oppressed. She has been a voice and an actor reminiscent of the central figure of the Christian faith, Jesus of Nazareth, who constantly spoke up and spoke out in behalf of those who needed voice and action. Bishop Jeffrey Shorey is here as the second annual C.S. Lewis Legacy Lecture. C.S. Lewis was one of those who was not afraid of controversy and one who welcomed a conversation with everyone and with diverse points of view and conflicting positions. He contended that people could disagree and yet be respectful, that people could passionately take opposing positions and still remain friends. So nothing, no thing, no topic, no issue was off limits for C.S. Lewis. And so we have asked Bishop Catherine to speak on a topic regarding which she is especially, perhaps uniquely, qualified to speak, science and religion. You've read her academic pedigree in the program. Suffice to say, she comes to us informed by degrees in science, three of them, and by a degree in theology. She comes to us as pastor, as priest, as professor, as hospice chaplain, as well as now as the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church in the United States. She also comes to us married to Richard Miles Shorey, a retired mathematician. She comes to us as the mother of one daughter who is a pilot, a captain, in the United States Air Force. She comes to us herself as an active, instrument-rated, third-generation airplane pilot. The presiding bishop could have chosen today to be anywhere in the world. And she's chosen to be with us. Bishop Catherine, we are honored by your presence on this day in this historic building. And we look forward to your comments as the second annual C.S. Lewis Legacy Lecturer. Comments entitled, Who Are We? Whence, Whither, and Why? Students, faculty, staff, administrators, community friends, and special guests, please join me in welcoming to Westminster College and to this lectern, Presiding Bishop Catherine Jefferts Shorey. Thank you. Thank you for this invitation and this welcome. Thank you for your sponsorship for making this possible. It really is a great privilege to be with you here today. As the war raged across Europe and Britain in the 1940s, 
C.S. Lewis made a number of broadcasts for the BBC, which were later gathered into a volume called Mere Christianity. The impact of those addresses was summarized by a British military leader this way. The war, the whole of life, everything tended to seem pointless. We needed, many of us, a key to the meaning of the universe. Lewis provided just that. Most of Lewis's mature writing can be understood as a response to the great why questions that beset most human beings at some point in their lives. Why am I here? Why do I suffer? Why can I rejoice while others are in want? Why do we die? Why do human beings alternately treat each other with base wretchedness and selfless love? The myriad ways of trying to discern our identity, origin, and purpose are the ground of all intellectual and spiritual quests. And those questions fuel every journey of exploration. Lewis wrote and lived out of a Celtic rootedness in context and a predilection for mythic or narrative meaning making. He aided many in exploring the great why questions more deeply, both in the context of war and violence and in the joy and grief that a marriage late in life brought him. He had a genius in his time for tapping the deep well of human consciousness in ways that grew out of his own very particular story and flowed into the universal. Lewis's creative and imaginative storytelling elucidated ancient myth, and I use that word in its technical sense as stories about origins. He used that understanding to connect the cosmic Christian story with human experience in ways both timely and timeless. He's a profound example of the impact the great questions have on human communities in and through time. We touch his remarkably perceptive and deep root with gratitude, for his work continues to influence the search of many, even more than 50 years after his death. I'm going to invite us to look at these great questions of life's trajectory as questions of identity and origin purpose and telos or goal, and the meaning that human beings seek in their lives. I want to evoke a broad sense of the human search for explanation or meaning making. And I'm going to invite us to look into these questions from a variety of perspectives, not just Lewis's. We'll focus on scientific and religious frameworks of meaning making. And I will tell you as I begin that I do not see them as mutually exclusive, but as potentially expansive and even synergistic. I see the scientific and religious stories as parallel systems of meaning that are overlapping in their method, but not identical in the questions they ask or the outcome they seek. With many others, I ardently believe that the stories we choose to give our hearts and minds to shape and give meaning to the life we live. The scientific ambit asks questions about origin and direction. But questions of meaning usually aren't asked in the same way they would be in a religious context. Scientific meaning comes from investigating the matter we see around us, defining and describing it, and trying to understand the relationships among the different kinds of matter we experience. Meaning questions are resolved in ways that have more to do with mechanism than value. Questions of how things came to be the way they are, how they interact, and what influences the changes in systems that we observe or prompt. 
And the questions about purpose are usually understood as projections about the next stage in a process or a system. For example, what do we expect to happen to the weather around here as a result of the carbon we continue to pour into the atmosphere? Or what is the utility of this particular shell's shape? What advantage does it offer the snail? These purposive questions don't seek a terminus, an end. They're far more about imminent realities than transcendent ones. In spite of the ongoing search for what are sometimes called toes or guts, theories of everything or grand unified theories. The religious perspective asks questions about origins in ways that seek meaning fundamentally. What does the nature of things have to do with evil? Or what does it mean to live a good life? Where are we going? Identity is important in both spheres, but again, the questions seek rather different answers. I spent the first part of my adult life studying squids and octopuses in the Northeastern Pacific. I was concerned with the identity of particular bodies of water and different kinds of squid, and being able to distinguish one from another, with the usual ecological hypothesis that different species fill different roles in the larger system. Identity was about the role of one actor in the system, and its relationship to other actors and parts of the system, who ate whom. Where might this species of squid live in the vertical and horizontal geography of a large part of the Pacific? Origin was also of interest. How did a particular family of squids evolve to fill rather different roles in the system? And why was this family abundant in the Pacific but absent from the Atlantic? Scientific meaning is found in understanding the relationships and deriving theories about how those relationships develop. In spite of the spirit of some fields, like quantum mechanics and its language for quarks that have flavor like charm or strange, science doesn't usually ask questions about the kind of meaning involved in moral or ethical value. That doesn't mean that scientists think these are unimportant questions, but the scientific method isn't designed to answer them. At least for several centuries in the Western world, we've kept these spheres of knowledge fairly separate, even though they're both focused on knowing. We haven't customarily asked if or why one species is more valuable than another, until we get to the science of economics and the business end of commerce. Yet both scientific and spiritual quests are fundamentally about deeper knowing. And I would assert that we see, know, and understand more if we're willing to use both systems. That assumption underlies Socrates' assertion that the unexamined life is not worth living. Let's think about origin. A story of origins is the technical meaning of myth. This college has a myth about those columns out there, right? You tell a story of meaning about their origin and purpose, and every student becomes part of that story by passing through them when you matriculate and again in the other direction as you graduate. Note that the technical use of this term does not imply that a myth is untrue. I have a friend who is fond of saying, I know this story is true whether or not it happened exactly that way. The significance of the myth is how it shapes the hearer and the wider community and how its truth becomes part of the hearer's story. A myth is both constitutive and constructive of meaning for individuals and entire communities. 
Until fairly recently, most of the Western world has lived with a broad religious myth, the Abrahamic story, and in recent centuries, a scientific story about origins. The broad biblical myth actually has two primary stories of creation, which say something quite different about the meaning and mode of creation. The first one speaks of God creating what is over a period of six days and resting on the seventh. At the beginning, there's nothing, a formless void. A wind sweeps over the chaos. God speaks, and light is separated from darkness. That's day one. Day two brings the sky. Day three, the ocean and dry land with its plants. Day four sees sun and moon and stars. Day five results in animals, fish, birds, and the charge to be fruitful and multiply. Day six produces human beings in the image of God who are also told to be fruitful and to have dominion over the creatures of the earth. Then God takes a day off and declares a holiday. The second story of creation tells a very different story that's focused on the origin of human beings. What's often heard as the, word, as the name Adam is actually a generic word for earth creature, Adam. And the first one of those is asked to name all of the other creatures and look for a partner among them. A suitable partner is not found. So God takes part of that earth creature to make another one. And it isn't until there are two of them that they gain gender. Then follows the story that's familiar to most about the snake and eating the forbidden fruit and the result that the two of them now know the difference between good and evil. They must leave the lovely garden and its dream time and enter real human life with its accompanying toil, pain, and death. The scientific creation story we live with begins with a singularity before which the tools of science cannot look, although there is plenty of vigorous and creative theorizing going on. <laughs> We call this beginning the Big Bang, some 13.8 billion years ago. The story moves from the almost unimaginably hot and dense beginning to the coalescence of subatomic particles within a few minutes, and after several hundred thousand years, the condensation of stable atoms, mostly hydrogen and helium and a little lithium. Clouds of these gases condense into the first galaxies. This is what we call the cosmological theory. And we have to note that, like the word myth, the technical meaning is different from the popular meaning. Theory to scientists means the be best explanation we have for a phenomenon. It best fits the evidence, and it's robust enough that proving it false would take a major discovery. Theories are often in the process of being refined, but they are seldom thrown out. The cosmological theory continues in our more local part of the universe as a gas cloud began to consolidate into a solar nebula about four and a half billion years ago. Within 10 or 20 million years, the sun and a series of planets had consolidated. This Earth's broadly layered structure and internal magnetic field developed pretty quickly in 10 million years or so. And around 4 billion years ago, a large celestial impact blasted part of this Earth into orbit as the moon. Vulcanism, the result of that Earth's hot core produced a shifting surface that we talk about today in terms of plate tectonics and an atmosphere of evolving composition. 
life began to appear and evolve on this planet very early, between three and a half and four billion years ago. The evolutionary part of the cosmological story is more familiar, and it continues through at least five eras of mass extinction and periods of rapid species expansion as a result of changing environmental pressures. In the geologic era, those pressures have included meteor impacts, mass volcanism, and atmospheric changes, as well as the selective biological pressures due to predation. Those are very brief summaries of the stories of origin familiar to most people in this culture. There are other religious ones, but the scientific one stands alone as an externally verifiable response to the physical reality we all experience. Religious stories of origin deal with meaning in ways that move beyond what the scientific one is capable of, particularly when it comes to the value, value beyond the instrumental and utilitarian. We'll return to the issue of transcendence after talking about issues of identity and purpose. We've considered three ways of thinking about origins. What does that have to say about identity, who we are, and what we see around us? The cosmological evolutionary story says that we are made of stardust, and so is everything else around us. Notably, everything that we can detect is made originally from that same primordial plasma soup. We human beings share a common origin with every other particle of matter or antimatter imaginable if we're willing to look far enough into the past. The evolutionary story on Earth gives a similar response. We are all products of the same stuff, even if some of it arrived as part of meteorites, comets, or other stellar projectiles after the initial coalescence of this planet. If we want a purely biological response, the theory gives the same answer. Even if life emerged more than once on this Earth, we all seem to have the same roots. Human beings also share common roots in species that evolved on the African continent. We are all Africans, all, most of us in this room, African Americans. Every human being living today shares a common ancestry. We're all related to one another, and we are all related to every other creature on Earth and every part of the universe. Beyond our identity as homo sapiens, what does it mean to be a human being? Science asks those questions, too. We're self-reflective. We have the ability to think and to think about our thinking. And we can make conscious choices, at least when we're functioning, functioning mostly rationally. It's apparent that a number of other creatures share some of those characteristics. Many other animals learn and change their behavior, communicate with some form of language. Apes can learn sign language. Dolphins and whales and birds use a variety of sounds and songs. Elephants, wolves, and apes give evidence of grief. Several species use tools. Some mate for life. Many live in family groups of mutual and altruistic support. Some other species evidently think beyond the local. Birds and fish and mammals, even ants, migrate across vast distances, directed by neurological and or genetic memory. 
some have the ability to recognize individuals after a lapse of many years. What makes human beings unique? Creativity, thinking new thoughts, putting together ideas and concepts that come from different realms, like the humor of wordplay, and even young children do this. Why did the duck cross the road? Because she didn't want to be a chicken. Much of what distinguishes human from other species has to do with the symbolic nature of our language and communication and the way we play with these symbols, even to the extent of calling us homo ludens, the one who laughs or plays. Our reflective capacity means we can project into the future as well as consider the past, we can reflect on our own reflection and learn from it. We can dream up things that haven't been thought or seen before, and we can think beyond what we see. Cogito ergo sum, said Descartes. We know that other species think abstractly, although probably not in the same degree that human beings do. Homo poetica, Ernst Becker calls us the one who seeks meaning. While we may find innate beauty in other species, the mating dances of birds, butterfly wings, jeweled tree frogs, we don't see evidence that their creation of beauty is an end in itself. Multicolored coral reef fishes have evolved their vibrant hues as warning to predators or lures to mates, and they exhibit relatively little variation from individual to individual. Their creative output is recursive, as minor variation on a genetic theme. Human beings pursue artistic ends, creating beauty, when their basic needs are met, as a way of finding internal meaning and expressing it outwardly, which is what theologians describe as sacramental, an outward invisible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. The beauty we find around us is a function of our ability to discern it. This has been framed by some as the anthropic principle. The universe is observable only when there is a form of life capable of observing it. In some forms, that principle imputes a strong force moving toward the creation of reflective conscious life. Other forms of the principle note that only a universe that's capable of being observed can produce reflective life forms. We do live in a system which seems exquisitely finely tuned toward that end. The meaning we draw from that is not susceptible to a scientific answer. Back to beauty, or in a larger sense, awe, and our ability to recognize or appreciate it. Some of that capacity seems to be intrinsic, and some is deeply cultural, taught and learned in community. The experience of awe seems to be uniquely human, drawing us beyond ourselves to consider larger reality, and it is deeply connected to what makes human beings truly human. The two creation stories of the biblical tradition understand humanity as the product of creative engagement with the basic stuff of existence. The first creation story images humanity as a reflection of that creative force, which has produced all that is. That story sets up human beings in their diversity as those charged to care for all the creatures of the earth as part of their own household. That language is usually translated as to have dominion over. 
Yet rather than domination, it suggests the domus, the house in which all creatures live and human beings as housekeepers and husbanders of the whole, whatever their gender. The language of the second story, and here I quote, then the Lord God formed man, Adam, from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man, Adam, became, human, became a living being. Again, Adam means an earth creature. The connection remains in English. Human comes from the same root as humus. It's yet another echo of the understanding that we come from the same dust as the stars, even if we think it's really special dust. <laughs> this story of origins goes on to explicate an understanding of evil as individual or communal choice that denies that interconnectedness with the ground of all being. Original sin is not about sex. It's about selfishness and a lack of humility, which also comes from that root for earth. This understanding of interconnectedness is present in many other creation stories. Indigenous spiritual traditions often point to a fundamental identity that lies in relationship rather than individual existence, and that the deeper meaning of human life is found in relationship with other human beings and with all that is. It's important to point out that the impetus and ability to seek meaning through a symbolic story is evidence of what we've talked about as distinguishing human beings from other creatures. This is homo poetica at work. All right, let's move to purpose and meaning. Why are we here? And how shall we live? I want to insist that the way we understand the story or stories of origin ultimately shapes how we live our lives. If we're going to be congruent creatures, and we can use different language for this, authentic, true, truly human, spiritually grounded, living moral lives, the framework through which we live has to have enough substance to energize, support, encourage, and inspire us through the vicissitudes and joys of life. It has to offer sufficient meaning to give a sense of purpose to life, for otherwise we wander forever in a dark and fairly empty existence, the best of which might be eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The stories we live by can be given or chosen, and both seem to be of importance. A given one, whether it's inherited or enculturated, provides a container and boundaries for creative engagement. To choose a story means to give one's heart to it, literally to love and believe it, expecting the framework to offer life. Meaning in time of despair, urgency in the dog days, and moral choices that offer life to oneself and to others. We can identify some commonality in all these stories of origin, identity, and purpose, some ground of congruence and coherence rather than only their distinctiveness. But it requires reflecting on our own reflection. We've touched on some of this already. The scientific story begins in a powerful burst of creativity out of which emerges all we can see and experience. The religious stories also speak of common origins, either from the primordial chaos over which the creative spirit moves, yielding water, sun, earth, and creatures, 
or the garden from which the plants, animals, and human beings are created. In each of those stories, everything that is partakes of the same stuff. All that is, is related, connected, in ways that are ultimately beyond our full comprehension. The dusty, earthy interconnections remind us that the human being's true character ought to be one of humility, created of and connected to the earth and the stars. These stories evoke a unitary origin and a common identity for all parts of the cosmos. The local is related to the general because of their or our common origin and identity. The imminent partakes of the transcendent. There's a lovely Hindu image that points to this. It's called Indra's net. It's like a giant fishnet with a jewel at each node of the web. And every jewel reflects all of the other jewels, something like a hologram. These stories, both scientific and religious, encourage a reflective and learning attitude in their use, one that operates over years and generations. Science advances by making hypotheses, gathering data to test the hypothesis, and then adjusts the hypothesis in an iterative process until a fairly robust theory emerges. Religious stories are born of reflection on human life and relationship and asking questions of meaning. They develop theologically through what's called praxis and reflection, doing something and reflecting on the outcome of the deeds, and then adjusting the practice toward a more fruitful, life-giving, or virtuous result. In both of those systems, questions and doubt are potential sources of growth and learning. They are essential to the lively exercise of each tradition. Paradigms shift when a theory or a robust story no longer fits experience. It's a profoundly disorienting experience for the communities involved when the paradigm shifts, but it is a necessary kind of death that permits other, another more fruitful and heuristically useful story to emerge. We can see it both in the kind of shift from Newtonian mechanics to relativity theory and in the expansion of the first covenant biblical narrative to the second Christian story. We touched briefly on beauty and awe. What happens when we consider the transcendent qualities of being in addressing these questions of greater meaning? Beauty, goodness, and truth are aspects of existence that have long been considered to partake of, co- of the cosmic rather than only the local or imminent context. We've already noted the transcendent concept of unity, that all matter has a common source and origin. The Egyptians and Greeks and later Hindu and Abrahamic philosophers and theologians reconceived these as justice, and wisdom. Elements are present in the scientific worldview as well, particularly in the sense that true theories are elegant, simple, and beautiful. The urgent significance of transcendent values arises when we ask the questions about how to live. We've noted already the unitary nature of reality, that we are fundamentally related to all that is, having arisen from a common source and substance. From that, the religious 
the worldviews formed by religious narratives of origin derive ethical systems that deal with issues of justice. The value assigned to different parts of the cosmos and what right relationships among those elements look like. Wisdom is both the method of inculcating justice in human life and wisdom is also an internal human content of justice. What I know and what I do and the transformation toward the truer or more beautiful or the good that results. These are issues of transcendent significance, particularly in an era when human activity is rapidly depleting the life-giving and nurturing character of the environment in which we live. For the first time, we have the ability to effect a global extinction event of the same magnitude as the great Cretaceous asteroidal fireball. The interconnectedness of all evokes a responsibility for right use, for appropriate humility in caring for all members of the household. What does a productive garden look like? How do we steward the whole or the small part we occupy? The scientific story will continue to remind us that we are not capable of acting in isolation and that the stochastic nature of things means that the results of our actions will never be wholly predictable. It's an urge to caution, modesty, and consideration. Even at a far more basic level, our behavior and decisions have to consider the implications of our action because of that level of unpredictability. The garbage we throw out today will come back to us tomorrow, in some way, for there is nowhere we can throw it that is truly away. We need to tell the stories of creation over and over, for it is the only way that we will move from an anthropocentric view of the universe to a networked and systemic vision that understands our part in the whole. Then we may look for meaning in life that serves the whole rather than one microscopic moat. For none of us truly matters unless all of creation does. This is what C.S. Lewis understood so deeply. Born in the Irish context of ancient domination by a power that saw his land as resource to be exploited, he looked toward a story of transformative justice, even if it required the giving of one's life. He looked deep into his community's past both Celtic and Christian, tribal and communal, in search of an ethic that would transcend the story of exploitation and empire. He kept telling that story in new contexts, in reflective and creative ways that have helped generations to see the fundamental truth and beauty and goodness that give ultimate meaning to life, to each life, and to all of life. We are born of stardust, and so are our neighbors, all our neighbors on this planet and beyond. We share the dignity of the heavens, and we are bound for wholeness and oneness with all that is. Our meaning is to be found in the life we live and the liveliness we leave around us and behind us. That liveliness is fostered by the willingness to let go of it, that it may return in even greater strength. The great sages and mystics have all understood the fundamental unity and interdependence of our existence. Dame Julian, Hildegard, 
Meister Eckhart and Professor Einstein, Werner Heisenberg and Teilhard de Chardin, Martin Luther King, Thomas Berry, Nelson Mandela. The wisdom teachers of the ages counsel justice as the way to augment and increase the meaning and depth of life for all. Justice is the fruit of self-awareness, humility, and the valuing of all. What the baptismal prayer in my tradition describes as an inquiring and discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, a spirit to know and to love God, and the gift of joy and wonder in all God's works. What story or stories do you give your heart to? actually to remain standing or stand again for those of you who are able. And now my sisters and my brothers receive this benediction. We are a part of God's beloved and we are God's beloved. The stuff of stardust and mystery, we are shaped and formed by that which is beyond all understanding held by the one who is as close as our very breath. Wrapped in this knowledge of who we are, let us go forth now, finely tuned to our radical connection, tied to one another, bound to creation, and bound to the divine. Let us, my brothers and sisters, let us leave this place in love. Amen.